so this is an interesting subject because I don't, do you all hear about the social determinants of health? Here is this, yeah, it's like become very, very popular to think about what those are and how does employment fit into that because a lot of these, a lot of times people think about other determinants of health. So go ahead, Josh. So we do know, and, and uh, Bob Drake was the founder of IPS, what we do know is employment is a critical mental health intervention. And so we know when we talk about social determinants of health that it's not just about all these other things that have to do with a person's life and employment comes secondary. It's, it's a necessary part. So these are, the different, um, these are some of the different determinants of health. There's um, quality of health care, quality of education, community context, neighborhood, and built environment. So kind of where people live within their community and their neighborhoods. And so uh, uh, one of them is economic stability. And so that's where this comes in because, of course, that's what a job gives you is economic stability. And it's the connection between financial resources people have, income, cost of living, social economic status, and their health. This area includes key issues such as poverty, employment, food, security, and housing. So all those things come under employment, that when you have employment and you have money, you're able to have these other things. Now we do know um, with mental health that the mortality rate is um, less, that um, this is from WHO, the World Health Organization, that people with serious mental health disorders die 10 to 25 years sooner than a regular population of people. And the vast majority of deaths with serious mental illness are preventable. So really the causes behind the death of people are things that can be prevented. So people with mental health conditions are at higher risk of poverty, social isolation, trauma, lack of access to health care, the pharmaceutical companies, there's, you know, usually people, if they have a serious mental illness, are on a lot of medications, and these are really strong uh, medications. It's, and so um, a substance use, tobacco, and obesity. And also with the, with the psychopharmaceutical um, medications is that people are often on multiple different types of medication. It's usually not just one. So does anybody have any questions so far about this? Any thoughts about it? Is it your experience? What do you think, Teresa? And you're working with young people. Yeah, yeah, because you're going to find a lot of times, uh, you know, that people have, because of that, their health care just isn't as good. They're not as, you know, aware. Of that. Okay. So how might this be preventable then? If it is preventable, how might it be preventable? So <clears throat> if we have a reduction in poverty and people have an income, a further away from social isolation and trauma, and so it gives people a sense of contributing and being a member of the community. And you'll hear people say that over and over when I'm working with people is that, you know, when I'm working, I feel like I'm contributing. I feel like I belong to the community. I'm a community member. And so it gives people that sense of belonging. Improved access to quality health care because people will get benefits once they start working. So that's something that you know, we often you know, can take for granted. And <clears throat> I think it's important for us to think about other benefits besides Social Security for people that work, that they can actually get benefits. Is, is Hawaii, do you have a Medicaid expansion state, or are you? I believe so, yeah. OK. OK, so that gives people health care. So the pharmaceutical effects, IPS team works closely with a person's prescriber in order to coordinate treatment. So within IPS, when we meet as an integrated treatment team and the psychiatrist is a part of that, we can also be providing feedback about how the person's doing on the job and what we see happening. Again, prescribers are often in, a, in, a, you know, an, in an office on their own in a clinic and they're seeing somebody 20 minutes, maybe once every three months. So these are other preventable risks. Substance use. 
you know, because there's a higher risk of substances. And, you know, of course, if there's substance use, then you're going to have um, a job is going to give you a sense of purpose, a reason to get up in the morning, again, to feel like you're contributing to society. So often people will reduce their use or stop using. So it's kind of like a harm reduction for people. Tobacco, it's gotten harsh for people that smoke at places where they don't allow smoking, right? So now you've got to go and go 150 feet beyond the property and all this other stuff, you know? So if you're working, it makes it harder to be using as much tobacco as if you're sitting home in your apartment, uh, <clears throat> you're more likely to be smoking or using substances. Obesity, um, employment just gives people, I mean, you're just up and moving more. You're just more active instead of sitting home bored. So how do you see employment impacting health risk factors for people with behavioral health conditions? What other ways do you see employment as impacting people and benefiting their life? Adding structure. Yeah. Structure is super important. I mean, people say that all the time. And it's interesting because, again, I talked about this at the first session, but our belief used to be that employment was harmful to people with mental illness. We used to say things like, it's too stressful to work. Um, people will not do well. It's not good for your psychiatric well-being. So we used to tell people things like that. Now we know that structure actually occupies people's minds and it reduces symptoms. Anything else that employment does? It has to do self-image. Exactly, self-esteem. Yeah, it really helps with self-esteem and confidence. It's a social aspect too. Yeah. Connecting with others is a big uh, factor for behavioral health. Yeah, I love that part. And I, I just take for granted. It's kind of like, you know, I worked for so many years and I just took for granted. I had these coworkers and some of them were kind of annoying and others you really like, but they're around you all the time. And uh, there was a woman I worked with, her name was Sandy also, and she got a job at Costco as a demo worker. And um, we, we really worked with her as a demo worker to get her like, to smile when people walked up to her and everything. But she came in and she brought this card around the holidays that somebody had given her, a coworker, and it said, we'll be friends for the rest of her life. And she said to me, I've never received a card like this from anybody. You know, so coworkers are really come, come, become friends. Right, you're part of the community. Yeah, you really feel like you're part of something, a bigger, a bigger reason, a bigger cause, a part of the community, yeah. Benefits of working for people with mental illness are similar to those in the general population. So this is what we know, and we've said this, so we've hit most of these, right? Increased self-esteem, financial security, reduction in symptoms, and social, social isolation. <clears throat> So here's the question to you all. If employment is good, why is there such a large disparity between statewide employment rates and the numbers of people with mental health conditions working? Fear of loss of benefits. Fear of loss of benefits, that's right, definitely. Not a foundation of, of knowledge on, on how to support people in employment? Yeah, right. It's not, it, maybe it just doesn't exist or people don't know how to access it or there's just not that foundation. Maybe lack of reasonable accommodations. Yeah, could be accommodations. Lack of funding for support services. Yeah, that's a huge one. We don't have the funding, we don't have the support behind us. The belief that you know, they can't do it and their family thinks they can't do it. Yes. That's so true. And it's interesting because I think for vocational rehabilitation, I mean, people go into voc rehab because they say they want to work. If people go into mental health, then it's a belief like they've gone in for treatment. They've gone in to be treated, they've gone in for medication, they've gone in for therapy, but it's kind of like, but we don't know that they can really work. So this is, and this is a little wonky, I have to admit. So this is the general population in the United States of people that are working. So 96.3% of people in the general population now are employed. In Hawaii, your rate's a little bit higher than the national statistics, so 96.5. Then you look at people with mental health issues. So if you look across the United States, overall it's 21.7% of people. And if you look at Hawaii, it's 144 
it's a little bit it's a little bit wonky because if you look up above, this comes from the NOMS, and you probably do that. You must do it. It goes into SAMHSA because I pulled it off the SAMHSA site. So this comes from SAMHSA, but this is for people receiving mental health services. So it's the employment rate for everybody receiving mental health services. It's only 14.4%. So you've got a gap there of 82%. And if you were to say to anybody, our unemployment rate for people is 82%, nobody would stand that. So uh, obviously, you say there's a lot of people that could use help. There's a lot of people that could benefit from the supports of um, employment. And I, and I, again, want to emphasize this isn't just employment, it's education. We're going to help people go back to school, and we'll provide the same supports and assistance and coaching and everything else to help people get an educational opportunity. This is a study that was done. It's a survey, and it was a survey done of 11, 11 different surveys. Sorry, and so you can see kind of on the right, it's hard to read. Uh, that it says things like a statewide survey of people with mental illness, just overall. I, I can't tell you which state that is, the sheltered workshop participants, study of family interventions, clubhouse members, veterans and VA programs, clients in psychiatric rehabilitation. So they went in and they said to all these people, um, if you had an opportunity to work, would you want to work? Raise your hand, would you want to work? And 60% of people with a mental illness said that they wanted to work if, if they were asked. But 20% were employed within any of those settings. And only 2% of people who be, could benefit had access to effective employment services. So what I say when I go in and I talk a lot of times when I'm working with an agency, a public mental health agency, and I'll say, how many people do you serve here? And they'll say, we serve... I don't know, 2,000 people. Um, then I think in my head, 60% of these 2,000 people would like to work if they had the opportunity. So I don't, I'm terrible at math. I don't know about how many people that is, but it's typically far, far more than or have access to the services. So if work's so good for people, then why isn't it seen along with housing as a central focus of public mental health? A lot of times we will say housing first, than employment. I think we already got some of these. But go ahead, we'll advance it and we'll talk about it some. Funding, here we go. Funding's huge. So I've asked you all, so when we think about funding, um, you know, there's typically more than one source of funding because if we fund employment at a public mental health agency, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna fund itself because you can't bill a lot of Medicaid for employment services. You usually need what we call braided funding. But you could look at Medicaid waivers, vocational rehabilitation, and state block grants. So what do you have here? Do you know offhand? A state block grant, we are it. Yeah. And not Medicaid yet. You were talking about a waiver though. A Medicaid waiver? Okay, 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 yeah. I run into that a lot. So um, when you think about funding then, and, and um, Teresa, how is your program, how is your employment program being funded? Do you know? <coughs> okay, yeah. And this is one for young adults. You know, this is one for, you know, people between 15 and 24, yeah. Such an important age to be reaching people at that time. So the other thing is just buy-in, leadership buy-in. You have to have buy-in from the top, that they feel like this is important, that serving people with mental health conditions is important, that, um, that they just they believe and they're going to back the model. Because there's so many other things. It's like we have to transition from being a medical model to a holistic model of treating the person. And what we do know through this national evidence-based um, practice project that was done, and this was with all the evidence-based practices, if leadership did not buy in for an evidence-based practice, it would, it would die. It just wouldn't go. It'd be one of the things to get cut. 
So you've got to have leadership buy-in. This is what you brought up. You're, we talked about this as provider misinformation. So lack of understanding about Social Security. You know, there's just a belief you can't work if you're on Social Security. Or you're going to lose your benefits if you're on Social Security, so you shouldn't try to work. <clears throat> so that's misinformation. Many providers were taught that work is too stressful. And I hear that to this day. And again, I brought this up a number of times. What comes first mentality? You need to um, be abstinent first. You need to have you know, your substance use taken care of first. You need to have housing first. Then we'll think about employment, instead of thinking about doing it hand in hand, working with both at the same time. <clears throat> other things or other questions about this? Thoughts? Things you've run into? So many providers were taught that work is too stressful. That's in reference to them being a detriment to their mental stability? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of that. And I mean, that's, you know, that came from family. Um, and that's really important. We believe very strongly in connecting with family so we understand what their point of view is. I mean, it could come from providers. It actually came from doctors, physicians that would say, don't work. And for a while, the only model for young people, it was kind of like, um, well, don't go to work. You need to just rest for a first psychotic episode. The model originally was, um, you need to rest for at least six months to a year and just take your medication and not do anything at all. And then, six minutes to a year? No, six months. Oh. Did I say six minutes? <laughs> no, I might no, have. I, I may have misheard. I thought that was, that was quite a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah, I probably said it, though. <clears throat> uh, we like to think that people are their own best judge of when they're ready to work, instead of us deciding when somebody should work or shouldn't work, or it's too stressful, or this or that, or whatever. We need to listen to what people want to do. And we know that a desire to work is like one of the biggest indicators of being successful. Uh, and I love the one that we're, we're, not, we're not able to predict reliability or anything else. We don't have a crystal ball that's going to tell us that somebody will be successful. And I really strongly believe that employment's a human right, that nobody should be denied employment that wants to work. I mean, that's just outrageous to me. Everybody should have an opportunity. And so we know that the effects of poverty are terrible. People live on the fringes of their communities poor health, less self-esteem, depression, legal problems, and more substance use. So we used to say, if you think working stressful, think about unemployment and how stressful that is. Any questions or thoughts? I'm going pretty fast. I know uh, you mentioned um, work can be stressful for people with mental illness, but it just comes down to that job magic. Yeah. Job yeah. Just, right. It's an interesting thing. The job, the relevant piece, and, and finding that job back is of the utmost importance. Of yeah. All of this. Yeah. It really is. I mean, having we know that a bad job's worse than no job. Actually, one that you're really unhappy at is worse than no job at all. And then you want a good job match. But I think it's stressful. Every time I've ever started a new job, I've been stressed out. I don't know about everybody else, but starting a job it can be stressful. So. That's why you want to have all that support wrapped around people. And I'm sitting here thinking, employers need to know this, agencies need to know this. Um, one of the biggest things that my staff feel uncompensated come across are the family and strategic guardian yeah. parents involved. Yeah. And they even get dismissed. Yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. It really is. And we, we, um, really put a strong emphasis on bringing families in. You have to have the person's permission. Now, if they're young, you know, guardians and stuff, that's, well, a lot of times they will be. But, um, but I just think it's so important to hear what their concerns are, because you can't come up with solutions if you don't know what the concerns are. I think, I mean, from what I hear, is that a lot of the parents are, or the guardians are concerned because, it, you know, of the nature of some mental health disabilities, you know, that they might lose yeah. Benefits and what happens when I die and you know, yeah. worry about the Yeah. 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 So it's good to be able to reassure people, 
you know, with the supports. I mean, I, I don't know. I've only, I've only spent my life doing this. I mean, other than my waitressing career, but, you know, doing mental. Yeah, that's, too, yeah, that's right. Did you? Yes, yes. That's one of my favorite icebreakers I usually do is ask people about their first paid job, you know, because it's just so interesting to hear how, where people have been and where they go. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think, you know, just kind of being able to reassure people that we're not in our same jobs. And so if somebody loses a job, that's not a bad thing. It's, it's, you know, like Derek was saying downstairs, it's an opportunity to learn and kind of like, it's not a failure. It's like, let's take this and move forward with the information. So if we don't ask people, and IPS, it's really interesting on our fidelity scale, we have this item that's in there under agency focus on competitive employment. And it's, do you ask about people's interest in employment? And so if you work for a mental health agency, Typically what they'll have, it's, you know, it's a medical record again. It's not typically honed towards employment or education, but there'll be domains. So there'll be like housing, uh, medical, um, could be co-occurring substance use. And then it'll say something like employment, education. You know, and then they may ask, um, are you working? And the person says no. And then they go backwards and go, okay, have you worked? What is your job history? But no one is, is um, cued to push the question into the future. So it's like, are you interested in working? Are you interested in finding out how your benefits would be impacted by returning to work? Are you interested in meeting with our employment team so you can learn about the jobs, the supports we give? So it's like pushing it. So if we don't ask people, what do you think? What is the message we send if we just don't ask people about whether they're interested in working? Yeah. It's not important. It's not important. I, yeah, you're low. Not, you're not capable of it. Like yeah, yeah, low yeah, expectation. Overlooked. Yeah, overlooked, why ask? Yeah. And I always say, like, if you had a son or daughter or spouse or whoever partner that came home at the age of 24 and said, I'm done working, I'm done, done the rest of my life, I mean, would you go, like, oh, okay. It's not, no, that wouldn't be acceptable. No, it's not acceptable. So what can we do if we know that this is happening, that you know, it's not, it's, <laughs> if we know it's good, then what can we all do? And so we need to do a self-examination, the message that you give to staff, like if you're within a mental health agency or wherever you're working, the, what message are you sending to your staff? about how um, I prefer its clients, but I prefer job seekers or the participants, about the importance of employment. What kind of message does the organization itself send about that? I mean, is it more about getting people on Social Security so you can bill for your services, which is what I told you happened last week at an agency, or is it more like, you know, we believe this is a part of recovery, and it's the mission of the agency. Include interest about questions on intakes and assessments. Display written postings so when people walk into the building, they visually can see that employment's offered so they can ask about it. Ensure that people being served are offered assistance in attaining benefits counseling so everybody has access to that since we know it's a barrier. These are some signs we have, but these are signs that you know we post, like in our lobbies. You know, I'll give a short, brief quote from participants. <clears throat> but this way, you know, it, you know, because if somebody's coming in for medication management and they see a sign that says here are these employment so services and what people jobs they're getting, then they're able to say, hey, what about that? I'm interested in finding out more about employment. I love this one. <laughs> I think this has more impact than anything else in the world. It's like support ways for people to share their stories with other participants and staff. And so it's just a way of having people share their success stories um, about their return to work and the difference it's made in their life. And so we often um, promote kickoff events, and that's where everybody comes together, all the different partners, folk rehab, leadership, um, you know, people receiving services, clinicians, so that we can all talk about this, send the message of the importance. And um, 
So you can also have an employer come to the agency to share about their workplace for candidates. We love having employers come in and talk to everybody. Um, and this is Clark's story. So this is just a story, and we have Bob's story, so these are just different things. Show outcomes, data that support what you're doing. Um, but have those stories out there so people can read them. And sometimes, uh, you know, having that, again, in the lobby, they can be stories that are, that are written and put in the lobby so people can take them or read them while they're there. Okay. Employer Spotlight, Wendy's. This is um, a team in Alameda County we work with. And so um, this is Martin, Martin and uh, Juan, and this is Wendy's, and they're just like, um, you know, he got somebody a job there and they become buddies. <laughs> so, you know, then you have a spotlight on an employer. You know, build up those relationships that are important. Collect and report data. So it's really important that you're collecting outcomes because outcomes, you know, numbers talk. And it's really helpful to have those for, um, in, in Oregon, we were able to produce those and go to the state to help with funding. So we actually got more funding based upon the number of people we were helping to get jobs. Um, and you, wanna, you can share this with everybody. I mean, the mental health leaders, share it at the agency. We ask that um, agencies measure the rate of competitive employment across the agency. And they study that. Put that out there. Don't just collect it and not put it back out to people. I had a habit of doing that when I was a supervisor. It's like collect the data, that, but make it useful. So put it back out. And then what you find out is the more you talk about it and the more people watch it, then you see the trends start to grow. People start paying attention to it. It's like where a light is shined, people start you know, paying more attention. Any other, um, any other questions so far What I'm talking about? Your thoughts? Things you're doing. You know how you're putting posters um, of success stories? Yeah. So in my experience, because we usually get on the United Way, yes. the United Way usually has this huge once a year um, event. Um, they, they like to make videos, and some yeah. of those folks would actually get featured as one of those success stories. Yeah, those are wonderful. Yeah, we have a lot on our website. We have a lot of videos and testimonials and things like that, and those are really, really helpful. I think I really like um, ha seeing somebody in person, but it takes a lot of courage to stand up in front of a group and talk about your story. But, oh, my gosh, that to me is, like, unreal. The personal stories coming from people, you can feel it. So uh, I think this is one of the things Patrick was saying, but it's like, a, a guard against tyranny of low expectations. So just the belief that people can't do it. And you know you need to make sure again that, um, and I already did the son or daughter came home and told you they wouldn't work, but you know you need to make sure that leadership believes this and they're sending a clear message down the track that you know we believe that employment and education is important. Um, are there conversations about helping people create exit plans? Uh, this is, you know, people in mental health do not have to stay in mental health forever or, you know, receive the services of IPS forever. So it's kind of like um, we want to make sure we help people get out. You're all lovely, and I'd love, like being here all day with you, but I think if we were all stuck here every day for a year, we'd get, start to get tired of each other. So it's kind of like, <laughs> yes. And in a prior session, you had mentioned something about, you know, after a year, seeing if people want a different path, so, you know, you don't want to stay at a, a McDonald's forever, yeah. but what's the next? Is that right. in, in the same type of light? Yeah. I, and we would probably not even wait a year. A year is kind of like might be how long people stay in job support. So that's follow-along supports. And then we think about, you know, is it time for them to transition to the mental health team? But you're right. I mean, early on, I mean, right away, it's not our job just to get a person a job. It's our job to make sure they're satisfied with the job. So we want to keep checking back in with people to help them move on. Yeah, and that can be a part of, that's a great, I mean, employment and education is an exit plan. Instead of staying in a day treatment center and going to drop-in, which we did a ton of, you know, people come in and stay all day long at drop-in centers, Monday through Friday. 
What is your definition of recovery for people with behavioral health conditions? So what would it look like to you if people were in recovery? Uh, managing their, their mental health well, whether that be through medications or um, just healthy lifestyle. Yeah. So able to kind of maintain their, their well-being. That I, you know, I've met with a lot of people though now, and I don't know if you've heard in our voices, it's people that live with symptoms. So it's not like we're, we're gonna be symptom free. You may never be symptom free, but you can still live with that and learn how to deal with it and do it in a way that's you know, functional so that you can like hold a job or do other things. I had an a individual that worked with me and he was bipolar schizoaffective. Uh -huh. And he called me one day to say, hey, I'm, I'm not feeling good. And he said, I'm feeling manic. And we had a conversation and I said, okay, well, how about you don't come to work today, and why don't, why don't you call your psych and, and yeah. get, get an appointment? Yeah. And he did. And previously, you know, from months of working with him, I, I knew his style. This, this might turn into something where he misses out on work for two or three weeks. Yeah. It, it kind of spirals for him. Um, but he got an appointment the same day. He got medications. He identified that he was feeling manic. Yeah. Um, and that he might be going into psychosis. And he, he went from, you know, being out two to three weeks to saying, I got an appointment. I got my meds. I identified it, and yeah. I'll be back to work tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. that, that yeah. to me, sounds like you yeah. know, the definition of recovery for people. Right. Because, you know, He's, when I started working yeah. with him, that could have sent him off for a month or more. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a really good example. Do you do RAP plans, wellness recovery action plans? Not yet. Yeah, a lot of people do those, and they're really, really helpful. So it's really a part of like identifying. Um, it's like identifying triggers for your for your mental illness, and kind of like, what would I know first if you were starting not to do well? What would be some of the first signs that I would see of you not doing well? Yeah, they're really good. So you come up with all these. So you identify what they are. They identify what they are. Then you have an action plan behind it. So what do we do if I, you know, if I start noticing this? What are some first steps we can do? to take care of that. And so it's a whole plan. Who are your support people in your life? Who would we be able to call? You know, so you come up with a whole plan for the person in order to kind of, it sounds exactly like that. So they address it early on and catch things. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to, to implement. Thank you. Today. Yeah. The golden nuggets are what a day like today is worth. Yeah, good. Um, good. I'm glad. So how do we fund IPS employment services? So what we know is the key is partnerships, since we're not going to find one source of funding. And so that may be with the Office of Medicaid, Vocational Rehabilitation. Most of our sites and states have a partnership with Vocational Rehabilitation, and they're getting um, reimbursed typically by milestones. Is that, do you use that here? We use milestones a lot. Yeah. I like milestones. Because milestones, you're really getting paid for outcomes, and I like that as opposed to like a being paid for a process that seems like it doesn't go anywhere. But so that helps. And so they kind of like blend them. So you're not billing Medicaid at the same time you're billing VR. It's kind of like you're turning things on and off. So you're blending them or braiding them. We want to make sure that we're providing strengths based services. I mean, it's just really important that that's a part of it is that. It's an approach that was developed in response to the deficit-based medical model. So with a medical model that, that I was very used to when I started, you had to be defining the problems. And that's because it's tied to Medicaid, and Medicaid's paying for you know, the, what, the, the mental illness, the diagnosis. And so it's very focused on what are people's deficits. And so, um, you know, rather than seeing people with mental illness as permanently deficit, the strength-based approach highlights people's assets and potential for recovery, focuses on people's strengths, and improves the client-specialist relationship and vocational outcomes. So we just know it just helps so much to, like, if you're, if you're constantly pulling that from people. I had somebody recently, they were working on a person's resume, and they were, like, excellent at, like, the person hardly had any work experience, but... I mean, I think they've been, you know, a wife, a mother, uh, raised kids. You know, so pulling those things from being a, a mother, like if she can multitask. So they just look for things to pull out of their life and highlighted them as strengths to put on a resume. Experience doing that. So, I mean, that was really a strength-based focus. 
And so what can the, mental, what can the employment staff do? Oh, sorry, what can the mental health staff? So these are the practitioners, the clinicians. Uh, so sometimes mental health practitioners ask all of the clients about work, but aren't sure what to say if someone says no. So if I do say, do you want to work, and somebody says no, do you drop it at that? Do you accept no? But what we say is think about a variety of ways of asking the question. Don't just accept no, because this person may have been told that they can't work or they shouldn't work or whatever, so don't just accept no. So think of things like, how would your life be different if you worked? What would be some good things about being employed? What would be some not so good things? It's, I think it's really important to hear both sides. So why don't you want to work? What's getting in the way? Why do you want to work? I mean, if you understand what's, why they don't or what would be some of the not so good things, it gives you a lot of information. Yeah, yeah. And then what do they, do you have people that say more like yes, if I did? Yes. Yeah, definitely. It opens up a whole thing. Huh. 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 Interesting. Disability, I should be this way or this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's all because of my disability. Yeah, 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 yeah. interesting. Um, so how would your life be different if you worked? Oh, I already said that. How would a job affect your relationship with other people? I mean, because a lot of times it just builds upon that re relationship. Family and others, what are your skills and strengths? So focusing on that. The abilities. The, ab the ability is not the disability. Right, exactly. And capability. Yeah. Yeah. They could also ask things like, would you like to learn more about our employment services? I was kind of talking about this. So don't just, if somebody says no, you could still say, would you just be interested in hearing about our services? So and would, I, would it be OK if I introduced you? This is a warm handoff. This is really helpful to have a warm handoff. So if they have a relationship with a clinician, and the clinician says, would you like me to introduce you? We can go down the hallway or wherever, and I can introduce you to our employment stuff. That seems to really help. Would you like to hear about how your benefits be impacted by returning to work? More people need access to that. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And as we know, that's one of the biggest barriers. So I mean, if you have somebody has an opportunity to hear, like, you can work, and you're better off if you work. You know, there's work incentives. You won't lose your benefits until you're ready to. I mean, they're more likely to do that. Yeah. For many, many years. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the power of introducing, you know, newly blinds like the MRC. Yeah. The co big consumer organization. Yeah. That had, you know, peer measures and role models. Yeah. And people they could look to uh, or ask questions. How do you plan to do this on your job? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, a lot of a lot of IPS teams have hired people with lived experience, so they will intentionally hire people as peer specialists to work on teams, and they and a lot of times they're just peer specialists within the agency, and they help out with employment, and sometimes they're just attached to the employment team and education, and it's huge. Although we have no evidence, we don't have any evidence right now to show that there's better outcomes. Yeah. I don't know. Consumer organizations like the Tsunami are a consumer organization. Yes. Can they play a role in the Yeah. Yeah, we used to have a whole family advocacy as a part of the IPS Employment Center. So it was family members that joined together. And they actually, in um, Minnesota, they advocated with legislators and got the you know, IPS program there a million dollars in a year because they were such strong advocates. Yeah. If you can't get consumer organizations, I think they yeah. Decide to, I mean. Yeah. And a lot of the NAMI now is both consumers and family. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, family members are also considered people with lived experience from a family perspective. But, yeah, that's really important. So, some other ways of helping, you know, with people working are like, are psychiatrists available after 5 p.m. if somebody's working for them to see at the agency? 
are counseling sessions and therapy sessions available after five o'clock or is it like we're shut down? You may have worked today, but um, you, gotta, you have to take time off work to come in. We don't do any hours after five. I feel like that's one of like, the most wonderful benefits um, post-pandemic is that a lot more yeah. access to those type of resources have become available through telehealth. Uh -huh. And so what might have been restricted to a lot more standard office hours are becoming more accessible during hours that might not have been before. Right. Yeah, definitely more accessibility. I worry sometimes because I feel like a lot of people with mental health conditions are like um, typically maybe really low income. And so sometimes they're in the areas that don't have Access to good internet. Yeah, right, or, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. They're in those zones where they don't have it. My uh, son is a librarian in Ashland, Oregon, which is a very lovely city, but I can't remember what the statistic was, he said. It's a really rural. I mean, there's 20,000 people of the number of people that don't have computers. So they come to the library to use computers. Because wow. they don't have them. Right, because that, that's still... Yeah. A lot of people just really rely on their phones. Yeah. Like, do a lot of surveys, we gotta make sure that even if we put it out there, it has to be compatible with mobile hours because I think that's what most people do is just do everything on their phone. Right. Yeah. With the phones being so advanced, they just don't yeah. even have Even computer. like ordering prescriptions, everything is on the phone. Yeah. We had uh, work with an organization, they have iPads for everybody. I don't know how they fund it, but it's some kind of iPad that has limited capability, but you can communicate with the mental health agency on the iPad. I mean, you can check out hotspots in libraries. I can mm -hmm. do that, but I heard from the library that some people don't return them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, that's an issue. So again, we're selling mental health. Um, what can they do to promote it? If employment is a person's treatment goal, it's everybody's business to help them, not just the employment staff. So a lot of times, you know, the clinician will put something down like obtain, maintain employment in the community, and that's it. Then they sign off, and it's kind of like, now I'm done. And it's kind of like, no, 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 wait a minute. We're all involved in this together to help the person. It's on the treatment plan, so we're working together. And, um, and I mentioned how, you know, clinicians can help think about different types of work environments that are healthy, but they also can help with job supports. I mean, they really should be a part of the job support plan. And, um, you know, if somebody's having an issue with communication skills or stress management or anger management or anything else, that they're helping out with those things. Um, the team can be creative and brainstorming good job matches according to the person's strengths. So it's like, um, you know, they have a relationship and we can all be thinking about, based upon this person's strengths, what other types of jobs do you think they do well at? And it's amazing when you do that and you've got everybody sitting together in a team, the number of uh, different suggestions that come up. It's just, and they're, everybody's thinking about what's gonna be good for this person, what will be, and then you present it to them. You're like, here's some ideas we came up with. What do you think? Why don't you circle three of them that seem interesting to you? Everybody can keep their eyes open for available jobs that seem like might be a match. So, you know, I know that if so-and-so is looking for a job as a hairstylist and I see a sign in a window, you know, you let them know. Everybody's a job developer, we say. So this is just some quotes from participants. Um, when you're working, you're a part of the real world, is what this woman said. You feel connected. Having a job gives me stability. I have something to look forward to every day. And in the past, people might have used labels to describe me, such as homeless, mentally ill, welfare mother. Now my titles are financial administrator, college student, and working mom. So you can just tell how much of part of that identity it is. And um, all of us, when we first meet people, it doesn't take very long before somebody says, what do you do? You know, and if you don't have a job, You'll find out quickly. It's a big part of everybody's identity and what they do. That's it. Questions? Other thoughts or questions? How, how long did you say you've been doing IPS? Uh, I started in 2000. 2000. That's when we first implemented IPS. And you said at one point you were managing the employment services? Yeah. 
And I managed, I was the program director for the employment program that had all those other employment models under it. Yeah. And your current role. Yes, I know. How did that happen? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just trying to. Yeah, so I worked there, and then when we went to implement IPS, and we did that research, and we found out, you know, it was Dartmouth College, and Debbie Becker and Bob Drake were the founders of the model. And um, so we contacted them, and we got that SAMHSA grant, and they became our mentors. So Debbie actually, Becker was actually, joined my team meetings virtually way back when, by phone, not by virtual, right, by right, phone. Right. You know, and she would listen. We'd have it on speaker, and she would listen, and she'd have ideas for us and everything else. So I got to know her through that process and as we were implementing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and then eventually there was a research study, the Social Security, and she just called and asked if I'd be interested in being a project manager for the study. And so I was contracted for a number of years, and then I became a full-time employee. Yeah, it is. I'm really glad. Yeah. Uh.